It is time for our, our second panel session of the day. In the, in the words of the great Nelson Mandela, the, the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world is education. And we have a, a dedicated panel focusing on addressing workforce and skill shortages by developing local talent, attracting skills and professions in demand. Uh, an eclectic mix as well, and I mean that most respectfully. Uh, if we can welcome to the stage uh, the Education Minister Daphne Kane, the Treasury Minister Alex Allenson, Peter Reid, the Chair of the Island Skills Board, Andrew Stewart, who is the Director of Policy and Strategy at the Department for Enterprise, and uh, Kelly Corlett, who's the Talent Action Group Lead for the Skills Isle of Man Board. Thank you, one and all, and um, just a, a a quick chat, we'll, uh, we'll then open it up to the floor. Um, um, same format as this morning, please raise your hand if you've got a question. Uh, Vori and Juwan will be out with the roaming mics and also Slido, the, uh, the QR codes are on your table. And, uh, and also if you go to slido.com, hashtag gov24 and, and, and away you go. Um, as I can see, panelists are already in prime for action, so let us, uh, let's talk skill strategy. Um, D Daphne Kane, the minister, if, if I may, to start with, can you just um, succinctly explain the, the, the primary role of, of, um, of the skills boards and what its key objectives are? Certainly. Good afternoon. Um, the skills board was actually established before I was appointed, but it essentially is a bringing together of government and industry with education to form a strategy to look at the place to the island plan in terms of our lifelong learning, outstanding opportunity, and diversifying the economy. So the role of the skills board within that, with the published strategy that sets out the four pillars that we're working towards, is to establish what the gaps are in the skills available on the island currently, and to work to fill those skills gaps with essential training, but also future proofing us in terms of what are the skills gaps in our workforce going to be in the medium and longer term, and essentially setting up the Isle of Man so that we are fit for the future, and enabling alongside working, engaging with employers, also lifelong learning enable people to reskill as well as upskill, and I suppose essentially achieving the diversified economy, um, enabling the Isle of Man to thrive into the future. So. Well, well that, 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 no, that, that, that actually moves on nicely to asking Pete Reid, actually. What, what would you say are the key workforce challenges facing the Isle of Man right here, right now, and, and potentially how have they changed in recent years? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think everybody knows that there is a skills gap. And um, we've just surveyed recently through the Chamber of Commerce, and every... Uh, single respondent bar a few actually said yeah we do have a skills gap on the island and um, actually knowing what that skills gap is from proper data is a challenge because um, you get lots of different stories and I think you know the first thing is to actually be able to identify clearly from data where are the gaps that we have in the short term today there's another piece as well about how we want to grow the workforce as well. So if you think about the 5,000 roles that we want to put in place by 2032, what sort of skills are needed for those? And then when you start to look at these skills, you know, we really need to understand, OK, how do we develop people you know, from diverse areas, from lifelong learning, from on island? How do we retain talent? So how do we actually make sure that when people go away to learn, that they will come back and that we can retain them. And also, you know, the last area is if we haven't got the talent and we can't develop it quickly, how do we acquire it and keep it on the island? So there definitely is an issue with it. And there's some brilliant work going on, but there's not a portal where you can go onto and just find everything. You know, junior achievement, I think they're sat over there, have done a brilliant job recently. But, you know, that's one area. Um, what we really need is something that pulls in all of the different areas so you can get through it if you're an employer or if you're an employee. We, we've got a question actually about uh, junior achievement. It, it came in earlier, but it's, it's quite fitting for this, so we'll, we'll touch on that. Just while I've got you, you Pete, uh, well, what is the skills board doing to ensure island residents can actually access those appropriate skills and, and, and the qualifications to meet the needs of, of local employees? 
Well, again, you know, we, we spent quite a bit of time actually talking to employers about this because employers do it in a couple of ways. They'll actually sometimes go away from the island to acquire talent. They'll sometimes acquire it from within. Uh, they'll sometimes look for school leavers. But one thing that we did find, again, was there isn't a clear uh, place that you can go. You know, we talked about the Junior Achievement Portal, which is brilliant, but there's not something that actually gives you what the careers uh, guys told me was a, a portal where you could go in at any stage of your life and say, I'd like to retrain and do this. So how do I actually do that? What's a career path? What are the qualifications? What sort of levels of pay do I get? What training do I need? And then is that training available? So that's part of what the skills board want to create, is almost an umbrella to pull all of these areas into so that employers, employees, people not working can actually access those areas of information. Well, we're talking economic technical shifts. If I can change um, technological shifts, I should say. If I, I can change to you, Andrew. What, how can the Isle of Man ensure its, its workforce um, remains adaptable? and remains resilient in the face of, of those changes and, and what strategies can be employed if you like to future-proof the workforce? Wow, thanks, James. Um, so so I, I, th I, think, I, think, I think the answer is in the question and it's adaptability. Um, we had two really interesting presentations coming into this, actually, that I thought were quite fitting and then going into a conversation about skills. You have, the, you have a local economy, which some may think is, is maybe features more traditional careers, traditional roles, maybe roles that will be impacted by technological change, but not to the same as extent as, as some other sectors, all the way through to artificial intelligence, which could have a profound effect on, on some sectors, but also indeed provide lots of opportunity and how you, how you increase the value of jobs in the economy through greater automation, through uh, use of artificial intelligence. So the strategy needs to adapt. What, what strategies will we employ? I think the Skills Board have a broad, comprehensive strategy. Without wanting to repeat what's already been said, understanding what we're talking about. We, we, we talk to industry all the time, and skills is probably in the top two or three things that get raised every single meeting. But actually nailing that down to saying, what do we actually mean by that? What do we mean when we talk about a skill shortage? What are those skill shortages? And then you have some great provision going on, both through University College Isle of Man, through the private sector and training providers, that I don't think people are fully aware of. So how do we raise awareness of actually the training and upskilling that's available? And where there are gaps, then it's going to be our role and the board's role to, to fill those gaps. Kelly Collett, what, what work's been undertaken? Just a, a snapshot, really. What work's been undertaken by the board so far? So quite a bit of uh, work has been done in the background. So, you know, we've been together as a board for probably about 18 months now. Um, and I'm very aware that many of you won't have known that it's been that long to get to this point. So like any, um, I suppose, if any of you have done any renovations, you've got to make it pretty ugly. You've got to strip it back to its bare bones, understand the point you're working from, and then build that strategy out, which is what we've been doing in the background. With that, we've been doing some surveying. You know, those of you in, in industry will have seen the uh, future skills survey that we did out, um, which gave us some really insightful information. But it doesn't stop there. That, that's, you know, um, I suppose it draws a line in the sand so we understand that picture. But going forward, you know, what we're doing at Chamber, and in fact, a uh, bigger picture than Chamber, is we are setting and establishing an employer representative group. So any entities, any businesses out there who are aligned maybe with different groups to, and not Chamber membership, we want, you, we want you to be involved in this process to make sure that we are getting a complete picture of all sectors, all industries on the Isle of Man not just for now, but well into the future. So Bex and I have been tasked um, by the board to commission um, an entity who can support us with some data gathering. Now that's the foundation for everything, every decision that'll be made, it's gotta be fact-based, it's gotta be data-backed, and really robustly. So we're gonna be um, coming out to you very, very soon, um, asking you more questions, and it's the quality of what you give us is then what we can then put back out in, in the form of a decision, informing our actionable agenda and feeding into that strategy. So that's really crucial. 
So a lot of foundation work has happened in the background to get us to this point. You'll see the document, it's floating around, um, getting our terms of reference right, um, and right for both sides. I think this is the first formal board that has been government and business in collaboration, which is a fantastic achievement um, to be able to do that and get it backed by Tinwald and so on. Yeah, so, yeah. of things to come. I didn't realize it's been 18, 18 months. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Alex Allen said, if it's not an obvious question, why is the, the success of this strategy so important for, for government and, and Treasury specifically? Yeah, I, I mean, I, we keep on talking about the economy. And, and earlier on today, we again, we constantly go on about record low levels of unemployment, but high levels of vacancies. Now, that's seen as a, as a healthy place to be. I'd say it isn't because all those vacancies are actually holding back businesses going forward. They're holding back businesses expanding and developing their offering, both the Isle of Man and internationally. And we know that some businesses haven't expanded here or haven't even moved here in the first place because of lack of skills. So it is vital for the Isle of Man economy in general that we have high skill, high waged and workforce rather than what traditionally, looking back maybe 50, 100 years ago, was low-skill, low-paid workforce. We have transitioned a lot more of the jobs now are in the service sector, financial sectors, e-gaming, ICT. They are skills um, that need to be there to allow business to flourish. So that's the important part. Now, from a, from a government point of view, the reason we've got education here is it needs to start from the very basics. One of the things that came out of the um, Chamber of Commerce survey was the whole idea of employability skills. A lot of the businesses there are saying, look, give us somebody who can learn. We can teach them. But it's those basics in terms of time management, in terms of communication skills, all those sort of things that now education is taking up and really leading on to make sure we get the basics right, as well as look at some of the skills gaps there are in the short term and how we can fill those either through, through training or specialist recruitment. So, so Pete, what, what can individuals and employers do, do excuse me, to support the growth needed? Well, again, coming out of the survey, it was really interesting because um, what, one thing that was very strong was the fact that employers recognised that funding of skills was part government and part their responsibility. Um, and, you know, what we want to do is almost turbocharge that a little bit more to so we can almost start to engage a lot more with the employers get the view on the ground of what is actually needed in the short term, but also look to the future because, you know, we're sort of having to skill for today for the roles that we have in unemployment, but we also need to have an eye on the future. And that that's the challenging part of it. So working with employers is absolutely critical. And I would say if, if, if anything really needs to be deliver the MI properly, the data that we need, it will be through those areas that we'll actually be able to get that more accurate. Okay, let, let me open it up. Thank, thank you, um, all, all of you. Um, let, let's take this junior achievement question. Thank you, Joy. Uh, entrepreneurship is key to the success of our economy. We'd all agree with that. How do you rate the importance of running an entrepreneurial program in school, such as the student company program that JA run? Uh, should it be mandatory for young people to attend? No, why, Minister, Education Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, it's an excellent programme. We've had significant success, I think, the last two years with teams going on to national and international success. Um, it's a great programme. My, my own sixth former uh, student tells, tells me there was a great pitch from Junior Achievement into the schools. Um, I, I would hesitate to say everything should be mandatory, however good, because one size doesn't fit all. We've got hundreds of different students with various skills and interests in, in all kinds of fields. So the having, having a program that gives opportunity to young people to experience the innovation and all the aspects of, of produce um, productivity. I think I keep thinking about the apprentice actually while we're doing this. But when you see the people come through the apprentice and get through to the end and you see students come through from junior achievement probably not even knowing what product they're interested or could make and then the mentors that, that attend schools and 
bring them on. We have some amazing young people. They, the programme is excellent. There are so many facets that make up education. Um, and also, if I could give a plug to the department, also supporting, um, I think it's at any time, about 500 apprentices um, 240 applied this year and in addition to that 700 ish on vocational courses so there are many aspects but I think the the key in terms of being ready for the employers and what we heard um, and certainly from the step students the feedback I got was that employers very definitely like students to have work experience they like students to have some experience of working in particular and it's the communication skills it's those soft skills that aren't necessarily what you learn through the academic subjects but which are really encouraged through running a business or experience in the workplace so in terms of making the best of our excellent students to be ready for the workplace in whatever field they choose to enter yeah. um, I think that there is a bigger rounded package that hopefully schools can deliver many, many different multifaceted uh, education. Just mentioning, uh, Lars disappeared from the room now, I think, but what Lyra Axel said before about AI. Um, as, as, our, as AI develops, um, Treasury Minister, sh should we start talking now about the, about the future in that regard? Because we've almost got to be one step ahead, haven't we? I, I think we are, and that's what the presentation <laughs> was about today. I mean, AI is seen by some people as, as a threat, other people by a distinct advantage. We, we talked earlier on today about productivity as being one of the main things that's holding back, not just our economy in our island, but, but, but lots of other economies. Through AI and by providing solutions to particularly small businesses who perhaps don't have the expertise or the resources to do that, we can boost their productivity. We can therefore, me therefore that means that some of the skills gaps they have become less relevant because they can be filled by technology. And so their existing staff can be reskilled to produce added benefit for their business models. So I think it's all wrapped up in that. I mean, again, we, you know, 1,300 job vacancies. In two years' time, how many of those might be filled by AI? And how many of those job vacancies might have extra value for humans to, to do the jobs because of what they can bring? So I think we are developing the, these ideas. But key to this is the partnership model. That, that is, it, it cannot be gov for government to say, you need this, you need these skills, you need this technology. What we need to do is work with businesses to enable them to achieve this. Sometimes that's money, sometimes that's resource, sometimes that's support and advice. But the partnership model that we've got, the idea that the skills board can be a sort of one-stop shop, um, is really important going forward and something that I know Department for Enterprise have been doing for many years in sort of other sectors. So, so we have got, we are looking ahead in your belief far enough um, and this isn't to throw the Treasury under the bus, Pete Reid. Is there enough funding in place for the Skills Board? Is, it, is there sufficient funding? Well, there is at the moment. I mean, obviously, we're just going That's through... That's a political answer. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, what, we, what we're actually going through the process of now is taking our strategy. We have a, an operational plan of delivery, and we're starting to match up what can we do that doesn't cost money, because there are lots of things that we can do with companies on the island, but what does need funding? And there are certain elements that do. Um, I, I would expect that we will spend that money, um, but... You know, th that's not to say that we, we might, won't go and ask for more, but it's got to wash its face. I hate to say it, but it's no good doing stuff that isn't going to add any value. And I'm very critical of, you know, where we, we might want to spend money and there's no benefit. So there's going to have to be some really strict KPIs in there, which we've, we've already started to go through and measures of success that we will go back and look at as a board to make sure that that delivers that and goes on to deliver skills. Yeah, I mean, if, I, if I can say that we've agreed an initial £250,000 funding for the skills board, but that can't just be producing lots of strategies and lots of bits of paper. That has to be concrete in terms of get, getting the evidence and then going out to businesses saying, right, what do you need? How can we help you? And then if there are bigger projects coming forward, developing the business case to show why they are worthwhile to spend taxpayers' money working with 
I mean, individual companies or individual sectors to therefore provide those skills. And those could be private providers online, through UCM, who we work with as well. But again, for University College to actually come up with a brand new course, they need to be confident that there, that there are the numbers coming forward to take part in that course. Otherwise, it's not yeah. worth it for them. So it's getting that background um, data, I think, is really, really important. And then acting on that and actually reporting back through the Chamber of Commerce to the various sectors on what we can do with them to drive this forward. Andrew Stewart? Uh, so, so some of this is about, about prioritising and pivoting as well. So, so UCM, uh, you know, are, are good at this. Um, and, and I think there's, there's examples we can quote from the past where, where the requirements of certain industries have changed and therefore the training provision has changed and, and take engineering impacted by automation and, automation and digitization in its own way. You know, and a whole new training program suite and facility was developed. Um, I think broadly within existing budgets, if I can remember rightly, maybe maybe with some additional money. But but it is about saying actually that there's a change in requirement, and and we need to use that resource more effectively um, before we go to uh, the Treasury Minister with with a, with a greater request, request. So I think I think we have some experience. We have some pointers. We can you know we, we can we can we can highlight. But for as long as I can remember, people have been saying that digitization is going to change the landscape of employment. And it's never quite worked out exactly like people predict. I think we're on the cusp of, of, of a greater change than we've seen. But the reality is, we don't quite know what it's going to be. So we must remain agile. We must have those structures in place to be able to adapt quickly um, and embrace the opportunity of AI, digitization, technological change, rather than rather than the potential downside. Let, let me ask you, you, Kelly, if I may, how, how does the Skills Board plan to address the, the skills gap related to those lower paid roles? And, and of course, that, that, you know, that can be hospitality to improve customer service, enhance the whole experience, just for one example. Yeah, yeah it's really interesting because its needs are quite diverse in terms of the skills required there. I think getting really creative with the solutions that we come up with uh, it's not always a course that's going to yeah. be the answer. It's not always the training. Um, so, and I think that's why we're not called a training Isle of Man board. It's skills. Um, so what opportunities can we create for whether people moving to the island, whether it be young people coming through education, what opportunities? You know, we've already mentioned about work experience being fundamental to the success of an applicant going to a, a business, whether they've been through um, higher education or not, what we're looking at in business is what experience have you got? What kind of skills can you adapt and transition into this role? So I think it's about being more broad and, and creative with the solutions that we might put in place. Work experience is certainly important. There's someone on this very stage now who looked after me when I was on my work experience, but I'm not gonna mention their name. Um, Education Minister. Okay, um, let's take some questions from the floor. Um, Vori, and uh, have we got any questions? I've got plenty on Slido, but yes, we'll, we'll uh, let, let, what, you, you're here, let, let us take those questions. Just got one lady here, and then I'll, I'll come back to you, Sue, if, if I may. There's a race on here between June and Vori as to who, who can uh, get there first. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Karan Davies, uh, recruitment specialist, have been for 20 years now. I think it's brilliant that you've actually got this skills team together, but I'm just wondering what skills you're actually going to, or what you're going to get, how, how you're going to collect the data and what you're actually going to use the data for. And is it just for the youth? Is it for everyone? Because looking at how many jobs are out there, some of the roles that are advertised at the moment have been advertised for a year. They've been there a long time. And I, I, it does worry me a little bit. I'm not, AI will take a couple of years to get, so we've got plenty of time to learn that. Um, but I'm just wondering what skills you're gonna bring into the Isle of Man that isn't, all, well, that are already here, but what data information do you actually need? I don't know if Pete or Kelly want to start on, on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Champing at the bit. <laughs> yeah. And it's only because it's such a hot topic for us in the board. Um, so we were talking about LMI. So what questions do we need to ask um, of 
the Isle of Man population so that we're collecting the right data to make the right decisions. So you're absolutely right, Karan. We may have the skills here. We don't know until we find out. Um, so that's why everything's got to be data-led. All of these decisions and the direction that we go will be around that robust data collection. Um, so that is something that we will commission this side of Christmas. Um, we're very keen on, on pushing this forward. We've actually got a deadline. I think you gave us a deadline of April. Um, so there will be lots coming out about this very subject very, very soon. So once we've commissioned the right entity to do that da data collection for us, and we've agreed the question set, um, then we'll be going live and getting your feedback and getting all of that input. Pete, Pete Reid, anything further to yeah, add? Yeah, if I could just add to that, I think it's absolutely spot on. We, we also, uh, we spoke to some of the recruitment consultants and some actual headhunters on the island as well. Yeah, wait, I didn't talk to you, I'm sorry, but I will do after the meeting if that's okay. Um, and, and one of the views that we, we did get was that the data is, is, is unreliable that we're working from at the moment because there's a lot of duplication between agencies. Um, you know, the, the jobless figure is often what's going through the, the job centre, so to speak. So there isn't an accurate picture. And, and I've heard anything from it could be 40% inaccurate to it's, you know, 50%, 60% the other way. So really, we, we know one thing, that it's not right at the moment. So the, the critical bit, to answer your question, is we don't know what the skills are. We need that data to be able to say, actually, everyone's saying that it's over here in compliance. Everyone's saying there's loads... But actually, maybe when we do the data, it won't tell us that. It might actually tell us something different. And, you know, that's the critical bit. We need to look at how many roles are actually on the island in this area. And, you know, do we have the expertise to be able to match it up? So. Just, just to finish that, and we, we've talked about this before, can I, you can fill skills gaps without new people as well. And, and new people and, and, and additional you know, entrants into the workforce have always been required on the Isle of Man and, and, and realistically, to be honest, always will be. But you can fill skills gaps without driving, you know, not every skills gap has to be a new person. And that's where I think embracing t technological change and, and, and that and how do you maximise and how do you add value to roles. How do you, frankly, turn it back on employers and say, you have a role to play in filling your own skills gaps too. And, and how does government provide the framework uh, and the support to enable businesses to grow their own? Because uh, eventually some of those roles at the, at the lower end may well be replaced or may well not exist. But there'll still be there'll still be skills requirements right through the you know the the, the structure of other organisations. So business has a role to play here as well. Government has a role to to make sure it, it provides the framework. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I think there was a question from yeah from from Sue Cook. Thank you. The microphones are winging its way to you. <laughs> Um, first of all, I want to congratulate the Skills Board because I know how hard you've worked and I think it's an excellent example of the business community and politicians coming together. So thank you very much for that. I look forward to what you're going to achieve. Hope you don't mind. I've written this down because it's something I'm quite passionate about. So this morning we've heard about the economic growth and the importance to retain our youth on the island. I don't know about the panel, but my first job was in a chippy and then I've worked in a supermarket and I did babysitting all at the age of 13 to 14. In order to skill our workforce, it's imperative that our young people have access to work experience, to develop those transferable skills, communication being, for me, the number one. And I know it was that work experience that has helped me get to where I am today. Junior Achievement has lobbied the government to look at the employment legislation surrounding employing young people aged 16 and below. We've been told that employment legislation doesn't need to change. We have written evidence from parents and from students telling us there are not enough work opportunities for young people under the age of 16. And if you need proof, we recently advertised a vacancy for a 15-year-old and had 200 applications with 350 young people looking at the job. So how can we work together to get businesses to take young people in aged 14 to 16? Not only does it help our young people develop the skills they need, 
It helps families alleviate some of the financial burden that they're experiencing, but I also believe it helps alleviate some of the businesses. So I'd like your response. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, the, the Minister, Education Minister to begin with, and then Pete Reid, if I may. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have two young people. One started work at the age of 13 and was feeling very fortunate that she was able to find employment so young. And the other has yet to look for a job, though he thinks he might soon. <laughs> um, the, so some of it is motivational from the individual. I think that there, um, there are regulations in place because we don't want young people to be put in uh, posts that have danger, you know, working in a kitchen or with knives and, and other things. But I think that there is also, from employers, it's... Um, the, the younger one was found, she was constantly knocked back because employers wouldn't want to employ them until they were either 16 or 18. So I, I think, you know, there, there is a possible unmet need there. When we hear that, particularly in hospitality, there's a, a big demand for, um, or a, a, a gap in terms of post-filled, there, there should be an opportunity here to match one with the other. Um, but again, I don't know that it's all on government there are certain regulations in in place to protect young people from too many hours worked that could impact adversely on their education and i wouldn't want to see that that shift but certainly in the summer season perhaps and over the summer holidays there there's opportunity and and i absolutely support yes that it benefits young people to have had that work experience and particularly on communication skills pete peter yeah, I mean, how many times are we going to say junior achievement this afternoon? It's, uh, I'm, I'm biased because I used to do junior achievement. It's the scariest thing you ever have to do sitting in front of 22 kids that um, ask you how much you get paid and what time do you finish, honestly. But uh, the, <laughs> um, one, one of the, the things that you mentioned there was work experience. Now, you know, we actually had a conversation at our very last board meeting, which was only the other week, and I think that lasted about an hour. It's supposed to last about 20 minutes all about exactly that, because we all believe that it is a critical part of learning. And you know that is something that I would say for all of us, and I'll probably speak on behalf of the three ministers on the board as well, that we believe work experience needs to be almost relaunched and reintroduced in a way that it can benefit people. I mean, to be able to put something on your CV that you've actually done productively um, as opposed to not being able to put anything on because you've never worked, makes a huge difference to an employer. And having looked at thousands of CVs over my previous career, you know, from people that used to go door knocking and, you know, collecting bottles or whatever it might be, you could always ask them questions about that to find out more about the skills that they had actually acquired. So I personally think that that's a huge thing and I'd, I would fully support that we, we go back to government and say, how do we, how do we relaunch this and, and get excited about it with employers? One thing that we do need to remember is sometimes employers find it a bit of a pain to do work experience and, you know, I, I certainly certainly had that in where I worked and that also needs to be looked at really closely to say okay how are we going to do it have somebody responsible for it to actually build up a program that is worthwhile so that people can learn when they're when they're doing that work experience Thanks, could, 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 if, if I, I just but, but in do, I do apologize because one, one of the other conversations we had was you know obviously we just had the, the results from um, GCSEs and A levels and that's great but as you said Pete, it, it, it's having work experience on, on your CV shows a rounded person and it's really important. So whilst they wouldn't like to make junior achievement compulsory, there are other avenues for those people who perhaps don't engage with, with JSA. For instance, Duke of Edinburgh's award, trying to get that through. But I think the important thing is to make sure that students themselves, young people and their parents understand how important work experience is. Um, it, it, it is a vital part of learning outside of the educational establishment that education can help with, but takes it another dimension forward. The, the, the whole, and thank you, Sue, and you know what, I would love to come back to you for another question. This is, li this is lit up 
My, my clock shows one minute 40 seconds, so we're going to stretch it to five. I'd love to stretch it to more people in the audience, but I think there's three that have come in that have been waiting a long time here, which out of courtesy I, I need to put to you. But again, I'm sure our panellists will stay around if there's individuals that want to approach them. We, we are literally just going to be beaten by the clock. Um, when will CAM, business-centric subjects, become more mainstream in secondary schools? Um, it's an obvious first question for the minister, but uh, putting you on the spot a bit. Well, thank you. We are looking at the curriculum um, and align it more across the island in terms of the offering. But I, I, I think that, you know, that I would, I would hate to get to a point where students learnt only for business because we never know what the business is and what it's going to change. I think on the Isle of Man, we need to ensure that we have a, a very broad base of options for students to take. Um, and again, we've got to get the core subjects right and at a a good academic level and then we've got to allow I think some flexibility for students to um, opt to take those subjects that they they're interested in. Char Charlie makes the point other than the rebranding of different qualifications CSEs to GCSEs O levels etc there's been little substantial changes to schooling in 60 years is it a time for a change that fits the modern world the current system fails so many Kelly Cooler, I'm going to put that to you, actually. Is that, is that fair? Is it time to, to change the system a little bit, a tweak here and a, a tweak there, or more substantial? Yeah, my personal opinion it is, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, my educational background is baccalaureate. You can hear my accent, I'm Irish. Um, so very different to the education system here that my children have gone through. Successful for one, less successful for the other, but COVID had an impact on that. Um, on her particular schooling and her uh, ongoing engagement with education. Um, but thankfully, successful in employment, and she is earning and learning. So apprenticeship, for me, that's, that's the way. Okay, three, a couple more. Um, this one for Alex. Oh, sorry, Minister, you wanted to come in on that. Just, sorry. just on education changing, we're very aligned with the English and Wales system. Um, I don't see that we'd go off and do our own thing because people like um, qualifications that they recognise. But if you walk into UCM and you see the engineering and the the, the whole range of subjects that is on yeah. offer. As I said, the vocational, the, num the hundreds of people doing vocational training, which is 30% funded, the, the, from hairdressing to green technologies and beyond, it, there's, there's a huge wealth of, of learning that goes on with about half the students staying in on for A-level or uh, ha ha further education. But the Isle of Man has... Um, adapted, and I suppose when we will look at the previous presentation on AI, that is also something that the department's looking at for how can lessons be delivered in a better way to suit the individual student. And we've got to be aware of the the modern world that we're living in. Alex Allenson, thank you, Alex Allenson. Uh, has Treasury considered fiscal strategies such as lifelong learning allowances to support lifelong learning by individuals in upskilling? Yes. Thank you. I said succinct. Um, That's good. We'd like to expect. No, no. I, I, I mean, I, we're working with with um, the, the Department of Education Support Culture in terms of the VTA scheme, in terms of student awards, but it goes beyond that. Yeah in terms of helping people at any time of, of their careers in terms of lifelong learning, which ties into some of the stuff that the Skill Board will do, be doing above and beyond educate, the Education Department. Thank you. Um, two more. One of the most concerning areas within the maritime sector is the loss of skills and funding to our fishing industry. How can we fund and support skills within an, an industry which is, according to this uh, attendee, on its knees? Yeah, the I, I, I mean, perhaps going back to the previous one of the previous um, presentations earlier this morning, the Isle of Man Steve Packet Company have two apprentices, apprentice places, which are filled with Isle of Man-based um, um, people. And again, that's about the maritime sector. It, it's far more, far more general, but it gives that real grounding. I think in terms of fi fisheries, um, there, there is that issue. It, it's ingrained, I think, in, in the Isle of Man psyche. Um, that there will be herring on the plate, even if they have to be imported sometimes. But um, the, you know, the, the fishing industry again has adapted, has changed, has become far more technical with the work the DEFRA have been doing, and hopefully we can develop some of those grounding skills through UCM in terms of those people who want to go into the industry. But the industry has to be attractive for people to go into it. There's no point giving the skills if people don't see a career in that. And I think that's one of the things that the Skills Board, skills board JSA and others are trying to do is open up that, that careers advice to people wherever they are in, in, in their life to show them the opportunities that are out there on the Isle of Man. Uh, thank you, all of you. Uh, 
Great points just come in. The Chief Minister's tasked the CEO to find £10 million worth of savings. We heard that this morning, which inevitably will lead to reducing headcount. Isn't it a great opportunity to use the skills initiative to transition people from public to private jobs? I'm sure there's a lot of nods on their head. Thank you for that. And, uh, and finally, um, it says, good news to end with, sign up to participate in this year's JA Community Com Company Programme over 200 students, 32 business mentors, six linked teachers, all five secondary schools in KWC. Our students rock. They're end of the party political broadcast from the Junior Achievement <laughs> uh, Isle of Man. Um, I've got to, I've got to so thank you. I've got to say um, that I, I wish this session was longer because we have only touched the sides. Um, but the, the two ministers have very kindly said they'll be here for a little bit longer. Um, Kelly and, and Andrew are actually going for dinner tonight, so they're going to be here till nine. And Pete's just told me he's even booked a room to stay. So if you want to approach them, they're going to be here for a, for a long time. Can we thank our panellists, Daphne Kane, Alex Allenson, Pete Reid, Andrew Stewart and Kelly Corlick. Thank you.